Let me start. Mm. Uh, okay, firstly, uh, let me introduce Final Fantasy XV. Final Fantasy XV was developed by Square Enix Division II as a numbering title of Final Fantasy franchise. Its genre is single-player action role-playing game. The game runs on Luminous Engine, which is an in-house engine of Square Enix. Its console version was released November 2016 on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, and after that, some DLCs were also released. And final, uh, finally, uh, Windows Edition was released this March with various NVIDIA GameWorks technologies. So far, we hit 86 as an average of critic reviews and get positive reaction from end users. And here are the list of integrated features into Luminous Engine and the game. As we see, quite a few modules have been integrated. We started GameWorks features first, and later we integrated Ansel and NVIDIA highlights. As for Final Fantasy XV, HBO Plus wasn't used in this title, though so it has been integrated in the engine, and the flow was used for campfire only. But all other modules widely used in this title and contribute to upgrade visual fidelity much. Also, Ansel brings opportunities to take various types of screenshots and NVIDIA highlights automatically capture battle scenes and memor memorable moments and then provide those to players whenever requested. Today, we would like to talk about how the GameWorks modules were integrated to this title and what kind of problems were involved during the implementation and how they were solved. As first, uh, let me introduce our senior developer technology engineer, Evgeny, who explains terrain integration and tough effect integrations. Please. Thank you, uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, first things first, let's start with terrain tessellation. Uh, in this session, we're going to focus mostly on detailed terrain tessellation, which is about adding more details for close-up views in order to make it look more natural. If you think of adding uh, tessellation and displacement to your terrain, there are basically three steps to achieve this goal. We start with uh, hardware tessellation, so you just apply it to your existing primitives. Then we add some displacement, and the last step is uh, probably optimizations and fixing cracks. If you don't see any immediately, don't be tricked. Most likely you have to wait a bit until the testers come to you and show them. Uh, regarding uh, tessellation, everything looks simple with triangles. Most likely you are already using triangle-based meshes, and uh, applying triangle tessel uh, tessellation is trivial. You just treat your triangle as triangular patch, and you just hardware tessellation with it. But don't do this first. Try to go up with quads, because quads are much better primitive uh, to work with tessellation. They have more control because of additional internal factor for tessellation, and they uh, used to produce better tessellation patterns, unlike triangles. So once you have this, uh, we, we, we were able actually in this particular game to implement everything at runtime. So we took the original triangle-based meshes and converted them to quads in real time, and this simplified things a lot. So it was just an easy toggle, just use quads and apply tessellation. Also, try integer tessellation first, which means you apply integer tessellation factors. Unlike floating point tessellation, where those can have some fractional paths, and th this is supposed to avoid any visual popping. But the idea here is that we use integer tessellation to produce nicely looking patterns without any degenerated triangles, and we clamp it early to avoid any visual artifacts. Also, these uh, factors can be used as presets. So you use like high factors for high-end GPUs, and you just uh, lower it a bit for uh, lower presets. Let's take a look at this uh, screenshot showing three uh, different factors. The leftmost image shows you the tessellation factor clamped at one, which stands for no tessellation. And there is 20 and 64, which is maximum. 
supported in the API. So the middle screenshots show you 20, and although it's pretty visible, it's not capable of catching all tiny details compared to 64 version. It still looks much better than non-tessellated version, and this uh, trick can be used, the actual clamping can be used to find the best performance to quality ratio in your game. Just clamp tessellation factors and uh, use it with your presets. Once you have tessellation in place, you need to do something with displacement. Ideally, you should have displacement maps provided by your artist, but uh, because of different pipelines being used and different middleware, this is not always the case, and uh, this was the exact problem for us. We didn't have any. What we did is that we took the existing normal maps, which are commonly present in most games for bump mapping, and we converted those normal maps offline to produce displacement maps. Uh, for, for that, we used some internal tools. I'll talk about this a bit later. All you need to do is just assign proper scaling once you have this displacement map and you have accurate displacement mapping from your normal maps. Everything just works. So we have a set of tools uh, for materials and textures within our game works. Currently, it's super resolution, photo to material, texture multiplier, and we're likely to add one more tool soon, which is uh, the exact normal to displacement conversion we're talking about. So this should be a good uh, news to everyone who is interested in how to obtain good-looking displacement maps from normal maps. So once we have that data in place, we can already start showing nice-looking pictures with tessellation. But it's not about uh, just adding the details. Tessellation and proper displacement mapping add a lot to your visuals. What I mean is, first of all, it gives you a better lighting perception. If you think of an original non-tessellated mesh, you commonly have a big flat polygons. You have a light source and all shading, all diffuse lighting is mostly driven by your normals from your normal map. And it looks pretty much the same from every angle. Whereas when you apply displacement, this is no longer the case. Let's think of it so you're uh, looking at the sun, so the sun is in front of you, you're watching in the opposite directions, and what happens is that when you have a setting like this, you're most likely looking at different subset of polygons, which for the viewer means that uh, the most polygons he sees are in shadow. And that's why in this particular case, the scene should look darker with tessellation and displacement. And on the, on the other hand, if your sun shines from backwards in the same direction as the viewer is looking at, everything should be lit. You should see no shadows. It's like riding a bicycle at night time when you have a flashlight attached to your head and you don't see shadows. Awful experience for everyone. You have no idea what's underneath. You don't see any bumps. And the similar thing happens when you see uh, the lighting with displacement uh, and proper tessellation applied. To illustrate this, let's look at uh, two comparison screenshots. One is traditional rendering with tessellation off and now there is another one with displacement applied. And you see the second one with displacement looks darker. So it's obviously darker. This is uh, in line with our theory. So the sun is in front of us. That's why the most polygons we see and the most fragments we see are in shadow. This is how it works. But it's not like that. Once you apply tessellation to your terrain, everything starts looking better. Let's take a look how terrain tessellation interacts with other scene objects. Let's say we have a water surface, and if those meshes are low poly, like there are certain cases where those do not look good, and the artist may start hating you, like they can't express whatever they want with these uh, uh, low poly meshes. And if you apply displacement to any of this mesh, it can be just uh, terrain in our case, everything starts looking more natural automatically. You may not even worry about your water surface, but you may add displacement to that as well. Another thing is that uh, even though you may not get a lot of fine details in your map for displacement, you still, you still see a lot of good things from tessellation. So here you see the illustration how shadows start looking different. And those rendering would be 
uh, view dependent. So you see how initially it looked flat, like all the trunks were flat without displacement. And after you apply displacement to your terrain, everything starts looking more natural. Uh, that's it about tessellation. Let's move to our next topic, which is turf effects. Uh, turf effects is mostly about rendering massive amount of grass uh, with proper physically based lighting. It includes two-sided lighting, shadows, self-shadowing, and of course, uh, plausibly looking interaction. The idea in Final Fantasy was to use the original content because Originally, the game was developed for the consoles, and by the time we started working on it, everything was fixed. So we had to deal with the existing uh, content. So we took it as is, used the original uh, mesh placement and distribution to produce the data for Turf to be rendered. We took each individual mesh and pr produced a several of grass batches out of it with some variation in distribution. and. Uh, Although the, uh, the positions were not exactly the same, so it looked good, the only thing you should take care of is that sometimes you put your grass meshes on the wrong places because of terrain slopes, it doesn't look natural. So take those into account and most likely you'll be safe. Also, we tried to preserve the original look and feel because the idea was that you can use any subset of assets with turf and it should look good, like in any conditions. You can replace one asset to assets or all of them with turf. Everything should look good. We also had a special map to test all the assets, which simplified iterations a lot. Uh, regarding the rendering, a good part is that uh, Final Fantasy Engine is already using physically based uh, rendering with different shading. So all we had to do is just fill the G-buffer with proper data and then you just get the correctly lit image automatically. We also made it in a way that all assets should cast and receive shadows. Even at night time, you took a flashlight and it should look just natural, so you get shadows from that as well. Some people think shadows are not that important, but this only happens until you see how it looks in the real uh, case when you apply the shadows, especially when your sun is somewhere at the horizon. So the difference can be dramatic. And the same at night time, so obviously the difference is big. Like, you, you will never get back to unshadowed grass once you add shadows to it. Very important part with rendering the turf assets themselves is anti-aliasing. Because turf is all about geometry. There are lots of tiny geometry pieces with specular lighting applied to it and the aliasing tends to be horrible if you don't do anything with it. The engine already had a nice looking temporal anti-aliasing filter applied, but what we found during production is that uh, originally we didn't have any motion vectors. And initially you thought that everything looks good, but when, then with a strong wind applied, you see that the image starts looking vanished and the animation even looked choppy under heavy wind conditions. So we had to add support for motion vectors. The good news is everything is now there, so the library properly supports them, although we do not use the exact positions to simplify all the math in the shader. They're pretty close to ground truth, and you, here you can see how things look before and after. These are the two screenshots taken almost at the same time. The top one shows the original state of the art, and the bottom shows how things look with the proper motion vector supply. Again, the big difference here. Turf effects is not uh, just rendering and nice shading. We also have some good techniques to optimize stuff. Uh, we use per patch occlusion calling. Uh, uh, the way it works, you basically provide any depth buffer constructed of previously rendered geometry, and then we take it as an input and test conservative bounding boxes for each uh, turf patch, and uh, if it's visible, we draw it with draw indirect. If it's not, it would be just trivially skipped on the GPU. We also think of adding finer grained occlusion culling, probably 
up to each individual grass blade, but this is still work in progress. Could be present in future releases. Very important part of uh, turf effects by itself is physical interaction. Most of our uh, grass data was rendered with procedural animation, but then you have specific uh, objects which interact with the grass. Those are mostly characters for the Final Fantasy, and we used existing physically based meshes which were used as a proxy shape for physical simulation within the game, so we used existing content to simulate this interaction. The way the turf effects works is that you just sub-allocate these portions of grass uh, which are being used with uh, this kind of interaction. This is not procedural, it's used physically based simulation inside, that's why you have to store this dynamic data. So you sub-allocate it in a separate buffer, uh, you, ha you can uh, have persistent deformations this way, but the idea here is that you have some time and w over time you get relaxation, then the grass gets to its initial state and you remove it from dynamic simulation to get memory back and uh, to save performance. Let's take a look at a small video. This is how interaction looks with your characters. You just walk on top of the grass and so it just automatically get bended and you can see the trails. It's totally controllable by the artist how persistent your deformation is. But uh, initially we didn't make it too hard so you wouldn't break stuff. For example, if you have a combat scene so you should still see some reasonable rendering. Not everything uh, should be distracted. But the good news is that there are already some enthusiasts in the internet who took the original assets and modified it in a way that you get like better interaction and more pronounced uh, uh, interaction with the uh, turf assets. So you get more persistent deformation and so it looks better to a certain degree. And finally, let's talk a bit about the numbers. So the final implementation come up with a single grid covering 250,000 square meters. This is uh, the grid which moves with the camera, so it's not allocated for the whole world. And this grid consists of 40,000 uh, individual patches. All of them are square patches. Each patch holds approximately 2,500 of grass blades which allows you to have up to 100 million of grass blades. So you may have that many grass blades in a view, but of course you don't have to render all of them at once. It's not possible on current generation of hardware, so the library allows you to perform a smooth LOD falloff so you can render this set of grass at a reasonable performance level. And for the whole game we created 16 different assets which were used all around. That's basically it. Okay, uh, let's move on to Hairworks. Uh, here, Hairworks on off shot, uh, which is off and on. Yeah, in Final Fantasy 15, Hairworks is used for monsters' hair not for human hair. The difference is really clear. And here, another shot, which is off and on. Hairwax was applied to many monsters in this title and successfully upgraded the appearance of the monsters. Next, uh, let me show you a short video. Yeah, uh, this shows you uh, Hairwax Strand's expressive movement along the animation of the character. And here are another video. Yeah.
Okay. Uh, initially, uh, HairWorks was integrated into the forward pass to use transparency, but after it was moved to GBuffer pass to render velocity buffer in order to give proper velocity information to temporal anti-aliasing in the engine. This is a similar situation to TARP effects. During the integration, uh, we developed shaders to support motion vector, but HairWorks generates a strand of polygons dynamically from a few of control points using tessellation pipeline, so it doesn't store geometry in a buffer, and it doesn't have history of the animated geometries. So we calculated velocity of each control point and interpreted it along the strand, and then use it, at, use it as velocity of each pixel. Although it was not accurate, it represented velocities of strands well. As for shading, uh, Hairworks just filled G buffer and all of lighting and shading was left to luminous engine, which, which is also similar to TARP effects. Next, next is VXO. Okay. Uh, firstly, I show you AO channel screenshots for comparison. The one is SAO, which is luminous engine screen space anti ambient occlusion. And this one is VXAOs. Let me explain briefly how VXAO works. First, uh, VXAO voxelize thin of polygons into a series of voxel grid. Next, VXAO traverses the series of grid voxels along several ray directions for each pixel to gather AO information, which we call contracing. All of these processes are done in world space. Next is comparison slide. In VXAO, the occlusion made by the counter chair can be seen under the table. With the screen space AO, it is difficult to detect such occlusions made by objects that are far away from those pixels. Also, some of the chairs are blocked by the player character, so it is impossible to detect such occlusions from screen space steps buffer. Meanwhile, another AO is also generated on the floor, under the table on the right side. This is also away from obstacles, and since those obstacles are hidden in screen space, these occlusions also cannot be detected unless processing is done in world space, like VXAO. Let's check those in final composition. Here and here. I believe you can see the difference I've explained. Furthermore, of course, VXAO builds boxes dynamically every frame so it can produce AO along moving objects. As a simple example, I will show you a video that AO generated by the player character. I think you can see occlusions feature generated when the player character approaches a wall or a pillar. And you can also see consistent AO on the static object, which is not affected by changing the view angle. Uh, so far, I have explained the advantages of VXAO, but basically, VXAO cannot perceive bumps smaller than voxel's resolution, whereas the SAO is good at recognizing small bumps. Therefore, the result of cone tracing is blended with SAO. VXAO library has built-in SAO path, which is a subset of HBAO, and can be blended with the result of cone tracing. Furthermore, in Final Fantasy XV, it is also possible to blend VXAO with the luminous engine the screen space AO. Next, uh, I will explain a bit about the performance of VXAO in this integration. First, uh, VXAO has a complete separation between voxelization path and the cone tracing path. Voxelization path can be interpreted as a path to write occluders of AO, and the cone tracing path can be interpreted as a path to receive AO. You can choose processing object in these passes according to your purpose and the GPU budget. 
In Final Fantasy XV, height field, hair wax strands, and foliage are not drawn in the voxelization path. These are not likely produce complex AOs, however, those have a high drawing cost so that they are omitted on the premise of using any SSAO together. There is no special omission in contouring path, but you can skip contouring itself or changing contouring parameters with stencil testing if necessary. So I would recommend you to think about BXAO along your usage before integration. Okay, let's move on to Shadowbox. Shadowbox is a library that contains various shadow techniques. In Final Fantasy XV, first motorless shadow is used for self-shadowing of the player character. Let me show you two screenshots of a screen space shadowing buffer. Here with the first tracing shadow, and here with first tracing shadow on player character. First tracing shadow is based on pixel primitive intersection testing, and thus suitable for making geometrically accurate crisp shadow with really small shadow bias. On the other hand, conventional shadow map technique basically have aliasing issue and have difficulty to work with small shadow bias. And here are our final composition. This is without first solution shadow. And this is with it's little subtle difference on the screen, but maybe you can find if you play Final Fantasy XV. As you can see from the screenshot, with using first motorized shadow, small shadows with Flap pocket, small ribs, and belt straps were rendered with shadows, which it makes it possible to express more detail of the character. Here, I will briefly explain about this integration. Firstly, first motorized shadow needs to store screen space depth pixels into irregular z-buffer. These stored pixels will use primitive pixel intersection testing, so they can receive shadow. Irregular Z buffer is rendered in a light space, which is same as an original shadow map. Uh, but it cannot use a simple render target because it needs to store multiple screen space pixels into a single pixel grid. So it consists of lists of pixels. So constructing an irregular Z buffer is not a simple rendering. It requires atomic operations and UAB. Basically, uh, we need to store all of pixels in screen space into the irregular Z buffer. But when we think about self-shadowing of the cube on the left side, we only need to store pixels where the cube is rendered. This is what we did in Final Fantasy XV. By limiting the pixels where the player character was rendered, we significantly reduce the pixels stored in the irregular Z buffer. Thus, it reduces the workload of frustum traced shadow. This can be done with a simple stencil testing. Uh, next, uh, in order to cast shadow, uh, first motorized shadow needs to render object in light space. But again, when we think about cell shadowing of the cube, we only need to render the cube in the first motorized path. And in Final Fantasy XV, as we limit cell shadowing, uh, only the player character was rendered in the path. I think this technique can be used for various game titles as an additive feature. Or if, you, if you can narrow down shadow caster and receiver, first motorized shadow will not take so much GPU cycles. And if you also think about cell shadowing, crisp shadow can be used without any of filtering. OK, lastly, uh, I'd like to introduce you about flow. In Final Fantasy XV, flow is used only for campfire frame and smoke, which is automatically enabled when NVIDIA GPU is available and the high resolution texture pack is applied. Normally, we cannot move the ca camera in this scene. But today, I will show you a video taken with a debug view that will show you flow's consistent 3D looking.
As you can see, the flame and the smoke were rendered by flow have consistent representation in 3D space, unlike billboard effects. Uh, it was not possible to implement a lot of flow effect into this title, but this is not a technical problem. Simply, we need more time. Next time, I would like to show you a lot more flow effects. OK, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> and here are our staffs. So I would like to say thanks to all of our staffs and Square Enix. Thank you.